Okay, guys, well, I've got Luke behind the camera here filming for us. So, and it is recorded, so don't worry if you miss something. Why am I talking to the screen? I'm talking to the camera. So it is recorded, so don't worry. So I'll just tell you, um, my name's Gary Hill. I'm a ex-full-time professional photographer. Now I'm a chief development officer at Click Backdrops, or CCC as it is, because we, we do more than that. Um, I've been a full-time pro for 13 years. Um, last year, I was BIPP portrait and overall photographer of the year I've been to society's photographer of the year and I've got about 70 gold awards three fellowships so I kind of this is how I work um and it's mostly in portrait work but what we're going to do tonight is applicable to any kind of genre of photography so before I go into calibrating your screen and everything else um, my whole ethos is a color managed workflow so right from capture all the way through to print um, I work on a color managed workflow so that everything I do is all working towards what I get in camera to give them final output for clients. Um, my own lab that I use, which is Digital Lab up in the Northeast, they use sRGB as their print profile. So that's one of the color spaces. You've got Adobe RGB, which gives you a massive range of color and graduations in between. But unfortunately, most print labs, in fact, there's only Graphic Studio um that i know of within uk and europe that prints on an rgb printer everyone else uses srgb so for me when i'm working in the studio or working on location at a wedding or a portrait shoot outdoors i actually have my camera set to record in srgb because there's no point me recording the rgb color space for the way i work because i'm just going to get all those colors that i can't use in print afterwards and everything that i photograph and edit has to be printable because that's the way I work. So I hope that makes sense to people. There's no point, for me, it's like having, having a pint glass or a pint of liquid, but I've only got a half pint glass. There's no point trying to pour that all in because it'll flow out of the top. So I want to start for me personally with sRGB because it, it works for the way I photograph. So we had a little simple still life set up here uh, with a ram's head. Unfortunately, I've had to move the light to the other side, but it was just simple ram's head on a backdrop. Now, again, for colour, one of the important things with colour is you're never going to get exact colours if you don't get an exposure that you want correctly, because that changes the colour chroma values and the way that the saturation shows. So I always use a light meter to get my scene how I want it. So I measure my lights using the light meter and put that into my camera and that gives me the correct exposure for the way again there's other ways of doing it but this is the way i work so once i've got my exposure correct my next stage is is to look at the actual light now at the moment it's just the modeling light on on the flash unit that's showing but when we photographed this it was obviously the flash that i used now every light source has a color temperature we're using Broncolor lights today because that's what's in the studio. I normally use Elinchrom. Um, and it has a Broncolor softbox. So what comes out of this is going to give me a particular color temperature. Now, in an ideal world, that would be 5,500 Kelvin, pure white, and it would just give me absolutely perfect white balance if I set my camera to 55 Kelvin. The reality is we do have ceiling lights in here. We do have reflective surfaces. So we end up with colour contamination. So while I want this to be 55K when the flash goes off, like so, I can't guarantee that it is. So the first step in my colour capture calibration is to use the Spider Checker Photo. Brilliant bit of kit. Absolutely love it. Now, if I'm working commercially, then I will use the whole colour on the checker, <laughs> I'll set up a profile in Lightroom. But for my day-to-day -day work, which is what you guys are probably gonna look at more than anything else, I use the calibrated gray card. And what this is, is it's guaranteed to be neutral. And what it'll do is pick up any color cast that's coming from the light or the environment. So all I have to do is once I've muted up my lights and got them correct, is take a photo of that under the lighting conditions. So I would set my camera up with the flash, take a photograph of that, 
and that would give me a reference of colour on the grey card. Okay? Is that straightforward to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if I don't personally, because I'm shooting raw, change my white balance in camera, but if I wasn't shooting raw, what I would do is fill my frame as much as possible with the grey card and use that to set a custom white balance in my camera. And that would then mean that the white balance in the camera is set. But I don't. I much prefer to change it in the raw software to do it the way that I want to do afterwards. And that is just purely an efficiency thing for me because I'm getting old and I would forget to change it back. So it's dead simple to do it that way. So all I did before is we took some shots of um, the setup behind me and I took a shot of the grey card. And that's all I did for now with that. And what I'm going to do now is I will get Luke to we'll turn this off and we will come back to the computer screen and I will share, I will, I won't share my screen. I don't mean to, oh, actually, it's probably easier if I do share my screen. <laughs> I'll share it and then I'll come out of it again. So I'm going to go to share screen and we're going to Lightroom. So if somebody can tell me that we can see my Lightroom. Yeah. See my yeah. computer screen okay? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. So this is the reference image as such that I took of the little fine art setup that we did there. So it's the ram's head on top of a couple of crates. And that was my straight out of camera. Now, if I look at switch to develop mode, so I go to my settings, it actually shows me that the white balance obtained by the camera was 5350 Kelvin and the tint was plus 11. Now, actually, that's not a million miles off where it actually is. The Sony tends to be on auto white balance, pretty accurate. But to make sure it's absolutely accurate, I pull up the gray card shot, which is this one, which again, what I'm aiming for here, the, the software knows that this, when I pick up the eyedropper tool here, it knows that this should be neutral and this should be neutral. So when I click at it, if you watch the white balance numbers here, over on this side, click on it, and it's not changed a lot, but it's changed enough to now 52.50 and plus nine to know that that now is set as a correct white balance. So that's all I do with that, once my exposure is correct, to set my white balance. The other thing that I do is the profile that Camera Raw and um, Lightroom uses is Adobe Color. That doesn't match my camera. So I go to Browse, and I come down to Neutral, and I set that at Neutral. And that means now I have got my colors. Double check with the white balance. Yep, absolutely perfect. So that is how I get my white balance and get my capture correct from a colour point of view. Okay? Any questions on that bit? Do you want me to go through it again? Oh, it's all gone quiet. Must have done it right then. Must have done it right. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing now and we'll actually start to... Has anybody got any questions on that bit? Because that's important because if you're not getting your white balance correct, then it doesn't matter how good your colour calibration is. It's all a synergy that works together. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to switch now to the laptop's camera rather than Luke's camera once we've got – actually, we won't. We'll keep it on here, Luke. We'll keep it on here because you guys need to see what I'm doing. So I'll set screen share up. Um, but before I do that, I will open up the Spider software. So – First thing you need to do is actually set, install your software that comes with the spider. And when you do that, it then asks you for the serial number, which is in the box, and you can get it all sorted. So this is just opening up, and now I can screen share with you. So go back to Zoom, share the screen, get to the spider screen. And I was saying um, to Terry just before, I actually let my screen go out of calibration today. Now, because colour is so important to me, I always, do you want to move around this 
think just just for a second. I always calibrate my screen every two weeks to a month. If I'm doing any kind of judging, which I do for a lot of photographic organisations, then I will calibrate before a judging session, just so that I know that it's correct. So, everybody see my screen okay? Yep. 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 Cool. So the first thing I do is I open it up and it says calibrate my display or printer soft proofing, that kind of thing. Of course, I want to calibrate my display. So make sure that box is ticked and I click next. Okay. And it gives you a bit of a wizard. It's really, really simple, this, but really effective. So it says, have you allowed your display to warm up for an hour? Yep. Might have been okay all day. Lighting conditions. I've got no intense light. I've got diffuse light in here. Reset the monitor settings. And have I plugged my spider into the computer? Not yet, but I'm about to. So I plug that in into my USB. You might want to come this side now, won't you, mate? So that's now plugged in. And the spider's on the desk, ready to go. And I click next. Okay. And it tells me here that my um, MacBook Pro here has a wide LED because um, it's Pro Retina screen, just like it tells you here. But check through this and see which one matches your um, monitor that you've got. Okay. So I've done that bit. And again, I'm just going to work through the wizard. So I click Next. And it says, do I want a step-by-step -step assistant? And that's the one you want, the top, the top selection there, step-by-step -step assistant. If I'm using a multiple display, you can get a studio match and get it to do it so that the screens match, those kind of things. But just for here, we're just doing a simple single display. So I click next. And then I want to do a full calibration. Now, I always do a full calibration. I always do a full calibration. The reason I do that is um, I don't just want to do a quick recount. I want to do it and make sure that it is all correct. So we've got full calibration. Got my gamma set at 2.2, as is recommended for this monitor. White point as recommended and brightness at 120. That's what it's going to look for here. So next thing is, again, I'm working through the wizard and I click next. Now, this is dead easy because it actually tells you exactly where to put it. So I take the spider, click OK on that screen. I open it up and you've got the spider on one side and the counterweight on the other. I just give them a nice little straighten and I pop that where it tells me to put it. Now, don't worry too much if it's a fraction of a centimetre off. You want it as close as you can. And then once it's in, in position on the display, I click Next. And then it will start the calibration. And the first thing it's going to do is measure the brightness of the screen. So it runs through a quick check. Oh, it's done. It's... It's saying that the screen sharing is paused. I don't know if it is, but you should be able to see it on the camera. Okay, and now it tells me that my target brightness is 120 candela per meter, and it's currently at 100. So my actual brightness of my screen is too low, so I can manually adjust it on here. So I give it a little slide up, and then under here as a window, and it says, Click OK on that, and it's update, and now it's saying it's too bright, 139. So I just need to slide it down, just one, and I'll update again, 132. We'll go down one more. Check it again. I've probably gone too far there. The joys of MacBooks. Yes, I have. So I can actually just one, and update. Okay, so my screen is between the two. So I get it as close as I can. I would rather it actually, for me, the way I work, be a little bit under bright than over bright. So I've just moved it a fraction there. Updated, and it's as close as I can get it. So once I've got that, so depending on your monitor, you might just need to adjust the brightness and make sure that you click update every single time. From that, I click continue. And it will now go through the whole calibration process. And it does it all by itself. 
it just takes you through different colors on the screen and it checks them against what the reference color should be. And it literally takes a few minutes. It's nothing, nothing technical about it. The wizard is so good on this that as long as you follow the steps, you will get the right result. So it's bringing it round. It must be that the calibration software stops the screen sharing while it's doing this for some reason. If you pop round onto the screen loop for this, and you can see how it's just running through all the colors to make sure that the calibration is correct. Now, this might take a couple of minutes longer, depending on how quick your machine is, or it'll be slow, you know, faster, depending. This is an M1 MacBook Pro. It's about 18 months old. So it's pretty quick still. And it's just running through that calibration. Going through all the grays now. And what this is doing is making sure that what you see on screen is what would come out on print once you profile with your print lab so that we get accuracy when we're editing and stuff like that. And I'll tell you a little war story. I once edited a whole gallery. I like to edit in the dark. I love working in the dark. And I edited a whole gallery one night. And then I got up the next morning to check them before I sent them to print. And they all seemed very blue. And I could not work it out, so I recalibrated my screen, and it was still showing it blue. What had actually happened is I was using a, an iMac, backlit iMac screen, and I'd, and I'd calibrated while I'd edited whilst wearing a pink shirt. And what had happened is that I reflected onto the screen and made me see the colours wrong, so I had to edit the whole set of files again for colour. So this is now telling me it's finished, and I click Finish. And now it wants me to save that profile. So I can take this off now. Always put it back together because it protects the lens. And that's nicely done. And it tells me now, do I want to save this? And it's called it Apple Color LCD One. And I click Save. When do I want it to remind me? In a month. And I click Save. And that has now saved the profile. And then I can look, click on Next. And it allows me then to preview it looking at the calibrated view. So if I pick up something like this image here, now when I click, this is now the calibrated version. So when I'm looking at my screens, my gray looks nice and neutral. Uh, my blacks are right, my whites are right. But when I click switch, it shows that actually it was too bright before and that my grays actually have some blue in them. I don't know whether you'll pick it up on the, on the screen, but make, now it's screen sharing, it might do it. But you'll see that when I switch, which will go back to the new calibrated view, that it's much more neutral and not quite as bright. So bearing in mind, this is a fairly new, newish computer and a retina screen, it shows just how much it can shift over time. So if you haven't calibrated your screen and you expect it to be right out of the box, then you can't guarantee that. So doing it this way, and I now know that this is properly calibrated. And when I look at the reference colors down here, they're all correct. And I can try it with any of the other ones um, and it'll show exactly the same. So this is now my calibrated screen. So then if I click on next on that, then it shows that I'm well within the sRGB range here and I'm good to go. So that'll just... Literally now I can quit it, unplugged, and I'm good. Good to go with that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to screen share in Lightroom again, just so you can see. Now this is calibrated. I hit full screen on that. If we look at the grey card in the middle, you will see that that is now perfectly neutral, and we have that whole calibrated workflow. Easy as that. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go to my Zoom settings and switch to the, the camera on the MacBook Pro. So massive thanks to Luke for videoing for this. Um, he's had to stay. He's been at work since about 8 o'clock this morning. So, you know, he's such a good lad. So I will switch settings on this. Two seconds, guys. FaceTime camera. And there we go. You should be able to see me now. So I hope...
that you can just turn that off now, mate. Thank you. I hope for everybody that was pretty straightforward. Um, you're all very quiet. I know that much. You've all turned your speakers off. Um, honestly, if you just plug it in, once you've downloaded the software and follow the instructions, follow the wizard, it is so easy to use. And once you've got that calibration, then you know, as long as you're not adjusting your profiles too much afterwards in print, stuff like that, that what you see on screen is what you get back from the print lab, you know, or what other people see on screen. Now, what it doesn't account for is the fact that other people viewing your pictures haven't got a calibrated screen. You know, you can't account for that. But, you know, me working as a professional photographer, I need my colours to be accurate. I need my skin tones on my subjects to be accurate and be the same of what they actually are. So just following that simple calibration and making sure that that monitor's done. And don't be lazy with it. It takes five, ten minutes. Once a month is no drama at all to do that. But I'll let you into a secret. I don't know about you guys, whether you're professional, semi-pro, or, or pro-ams, or just amateur full stop. I reckon out of the 6,000 photographers I've taught in the last eight years, probably 50% aren't calibrated. It's shocking. You know, and you guys have got... <coughs> Really up-to-date kit with the spider. It is really, really good. Um, so has anybody got any questions? Excuse me. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Go on then. Um, so if you so if I I will confess I'm one of the uncalibrated hordes thus far. Okay. Um if you've just got the spider tricker photo and not the <coughs> yep. actual, like, spider piece at the minute. Mm -hmm. The the software that you use with that is the the camera utility, I think. How does that piece work? Uh, with the, with using the, the spider yeah. check. Uh, it's not the camera. I don't use camera utility. I use Lightroom or, or Capture One for mine. Okay. Um, but it depends what camera you're shooting. Um, D8, kind of Nikon D810s and z Okay, yeah. So it'll be if if you're using that to process your raw software, then uh, I'm raw just using Lightroom. Okay, well Lightroom's perfect. Great. Uh, so I don't actually need the, the extra software. No, you don't need the extra software. Lightroom just using the eyedropper tool, just like I did, oh. will set it using that. Great. Thanks. So that's it. honestly, that's the first step to color calibration. Is yeah. a great card, <coughs> and thankfully. Go on. I've got a question. Um, have I unmuted? Yeah, yeah you've unmuted. I can definitely um, hear Heather. My question is, hello. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I use um Bridge and Raw, and I shoot Nikon. Um, I don't ever use Lightroom. I'm a bit old school, really. Right. Okay. Let me let you into a little secret. I'm a Raw. And the Lightroom develop mode that we've just seen there yeah. is actually the same back-end software with a different front piece. Right. So It, if it going... seems pretty same functionality. That's why I've never bothered swapping over. Uh, the, the, the one I where, want... is, for me, Lightroom allows me to batch faster than it does in RAW in um, um, Adobe Bridge. But that's just a personal preference. I've been using Lightroom since beta 0.5 mm. so um i'm just used to it but if you're just using camera raw again just pick up that eyedropper tool drop mm. it onto the the spider checker photo and yeah. that will set your white balance yeah because uh, normally that's I, I try and do that but i i entered the competition because i was like oh, i can i can get one of those that's cool <laughs> yeah and it means that when i have that actual time when i'm not running a gun in i can actually go oh yeah. Oh, the luxury. <laughs> I, I will tell you, Heather, that the amount of times, the amount of times I have had wedding photographers tell me they don't have time to do that at a wedding. And I say... Oh, I wouldn't shoot weddings for love and money. <laughs> well, you know, or even running and going with a, a family shoot outdoors and all of that. And I'm like, actually, that's not correct. Because I, I'll use it at a wedding. It's just about preparation and going to where the bride and groom are going to be taking my grey card photo, or if I'm working outside with a family, 
the colour of light that's falling on me in the same field as they are is exactly the same. So all I need to do is hold it in front of me and take a photo of it, and I've got the same white balance. So yeah. you can do it. It's just about being used to it. Honestly, Mine. I never go anywhere. This isn't my light meter because mine's different to this, but I never go anywhere without these two. If I'm taking a camera, these two. I'm, I'm flying out to St. Louis on Monday for a, a conference where I'm teaching. And I'm packing one camera, one lens, two batteries, my spider checker photo, and my light meter, and that's it. They're the things that I carry everywhere. I carry a lot more kit than that. <laughs> oh, I do. Don't get me wrong. I carry more kit than that. But because I'm only flying out to teach, worst case scenario, I can borrow a camera and stuff like that. But I ain't going without my light meter and my grey card. Simple as. You know, and, and, and using the colour, using the full colour calibration, which I only do if I'm shooting product work and has to be 100% accurate. Spider has the most amazing walkthrough on the website that tells you exactly how to do that. But I am telling you now, for 99% of things, that is more than accurate enough. You know, I'm working with that, with the grey card side of things, um, and then a calibrated workflow means you will get good, accurate colours. You really will. This Honestly, I used another make of these. I'm not going to say what they were. For the last five years, um, and I much prefer, from a genuine working point of view, because I've still got both, this is the one that goes with me. This is the one that goes with me, not only because of its accuracy, which is exemplary, but the fact that if one of these get damaged, I love the fact you can pop the card out and replace it. You know, that's a massive plus point for these, but they're just brilliant. And once you get into that workflow of using it every time, I'll tell you how much we use it. Every single setup, once I've moved the light around, checked and re-metered, I'll do another grey card shot. That's how much we use it every single time because I want my light skin tones to be correct. We might, in a studio situation here, be shooting five backdrops with one family. And if that's the case, I want the skin tones to look exactly the same under those five different setups on each one so that when I put the gallery together, they all match. And the only way I can guarantee that is using this. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and going through the spider side of things, when you get to that point and you want to use a spider and, uh, you know, the actual, this side of things, that just ties everything together. It means screens are right. It means colours are right. It means that when you're using this, what you're seeing is right. Because it will be right. But let me let you into a tiny little secret here. This is a real workflow issue that people forget about. Photographers will go out, we'll do our shoot, whatever that may be, or shoots or whatever. We come back and we load our, load our files into our software. First thing we do, isn't it? And then you cannot resist looking through them all. So you start flicking through them all, like that one, like that one, like that one, and all of that, and then, oh, gosh, why did I take that one? All of those things. The problem is then you do your grey card. So you go into your software, you'll pick up the eyedropper tool, you'll do what I've just shown you in Lightroom, and you will see the colours change. Particularly if you're working outdoors or you're working with um, tungsten lights or anything like that in any kind of building, you'll see that colour change happen. And you'll go, it's not working, it's wrong. And what's happened is you've gone through all those photographs, looked at them, picked out your favourites, go, oh, I can't wait to edit that one, and your eyes have adjusted to the colours that you've seen. You then do your colour correction with the grey card, and all of a sudden, those colours will look wrong. They're not wrong, trust the grey card. What happens is your eyes have just got used to what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So I always suggest at that point, you go out of the room for a couple of minutes, make a cup of tea, grab a drink of water, then come back in with fresh eyes. And then you'll see that they're accurate. These things, there's so much development goes into making sure that the pigments on them are 100% accurate. Trust them more than your eyes. You know, I work with my, my boss here, Charlie, who owns the company. He's colorblind. So we have to grey card everything that we shoot when we're testing new backdrops. 
to make sure that it's correct. So trust that all day long over your eyes. But be aware that it will you your eyes will get fooled because I've done it and I've gone, oh, that's rubbish. I'm going to recalibrate and everything else. Also be aware of the colours that you're wearing because it does reflect on the screen, particularly if you're working in a dark environment or if you've got a table lamp or something like that at the side of the computer while you're working, don't let it reflect directly onto the screen. Does that all make sense to you guys? Yes. It really isn't hard work, but this is an essential part of color workflow. You know, for you guys that haven't got the calibration device, that's the next stage. And once you've done that, then what you'll find is that when you're photographing things, when you come back and you start your workflow and editing, it looks like what you've seen. And that's what makes us happy as photographers. You know, and particularly if you're dealing with client work, we need it to be color accurate. We really do. So for me, is I shoot in the color profile that my laboratory uses, which is sRGB. I process and make sure my raw software is also outputting in sRGB. Photoshop for me outputs in sRGB. So I keep that constant workflow. I'm not changing um, profiles all the way through. And one thing to watch is updates. Adobe has a sneaky little habit sometimes of when you update it, it switches your color profiles. Uh, particularly Lightroom, it can be a real little cheeky monkey of switching it to, to um, Profoto, which is a much wider gamut, and you can't print what you see. So always check those color profiles, and then you will start working all the way through with that color managed system. And it makes it life a lot, lot easier. Any other questions? I was just going to say, I thought it was so interesting, Gary, that you were using um, a light meter, which uh, again is is not it's not something a lot of uh, a lot of professional photographers do these days. No, for me it is it's critical. Hmm. And let me just show. Can I just show you briefly why it's critical? Yeah. Let me just share screen again and go into Lightroom. Okay, so you guys should be able to see my Lightroom screen now. Okay, let me find, I'm just going to pick up another image because this one's, oh, actually, I can do it with the ram's head. So let's just take something like the color of this. Now, we know now that we're calibrated, we're exposed correctly. All of those things have been done to make sure that what I see on screen is accurate. Okay, take something like this band here, where there's a bit more color, a bit more shading. Watch what happens to this as the exposure change. So I'm going to pump the exposure up two stops. And if you look at the color now, it is much less saturated. Yeah? Yep. I take it down back to zero, and that's my accurate color, accurate exposure. Looks what happens when I take it down to minus two stops. And I know I'm going quite extreme at two stops either way. But what happens now is your colors increase in saturation. When your exposure is decreased, the effect it will give, as well as darkening the image, it will increase saturation values of your colors. So they will look richer, particularly if you've got a bright color, for example. When we overexpose a color, we reduce the saturation in it. So that can massively change how that color looks, even if your system is calibrated. So it's a really important thing. I'm just going to try and pull up a color, uh, an image with a bit more color. Oh, here we go. Class. So we've got red hair here. Yeah, simple studio shot with red hair. If I reduce that exposure, it becomes much richer here before it starts to clip. As I increase the exposure, then we lose saturation. It becomes brighter and much less saturated in color. So it is important to get those exposure levels right. But not only that, I might be working with two, three, four lights, and I need to control the value between them all to make sure that my, my image is, is balanced as such. So making sure that, for example, my fill light is two stops less than my key light when I want a family portrait is important. Um, that light from the rear always appears one stop brighter. So if it's the same value as the key light, it's going to look brighter than the key light. Those kind of things are why 
I use this. And the other reason is it does an awful great to clients when you meter everything and you take the first shot and it is absolutely bang on. And that to me is part of being professional. That's how it should be. You know, particularly if I'm stood on a stage in front of 200 people lecturing about getting it right in camera. And I've been there when other photographers have taken six to eight shots to get it right. And I'm like, no, it's got to be right. First time, every time. Because that's what I stake my reputation on, I've, you know, as a photographer and as an educator. That's what I want. So any other questions? Has this been a useful experience for you guys to actually see how how it's used and why yeah. we, more importantly, why we do it? It's okay having all the kit in the world, but understanding the why of that color managed workflow. Very much so. Sorry, mate? Very much so, yes. Good. And it is simple. It's dead simple. This is dead simple. When you move to getting the calibration as well, it's all dead simple. Just do it and it, keeps us being right you know the same as the light meter but um if anybody's got any more questions i'm more than happy to answer them but other than that i think you know it is straightforward data color have been really kind to us all here you guys for winning the competition uh for me for sending stuff out to review you know i'm very impressed with it like i say i was I was actually sponsored by another company for a good few years for calibration stuff. Um, and, and it made it hard to switch, but actually I, I gave it a go. I, I ran them side by side for a little while. And I have to say the data color very much impressed me. I know they're not paying me to say that. I'm telling it from the heart. That's what it is. I state my reputation on it. So, you know, that's why it has to be right for me. It's been really helpful. Thanks, Gary. You're very yeah. welcome. Yes, just to say thank you ever so much, uh, Gary. That's been a fabulous presentation. So no problem at all. We can make sure that, um, you know, you guys will get access to the recording and uh, I'm sure Terry is going to make it available to a broader spectrum as well. Um, yeah, but, no, I, I will certainly do that, yeah. Yeah, and I just want to thank um, Charlie at Click Props Backdrops for letting us use the studio and keeping Luke on tonight and... And all of that. And if you've got any questions, my email is always available and stuff like that. So thank you very much for coming along. Hope it's been useful. Um, and yeah, if there's no more questions, Terry, then I think we're, we're pretty pretty good on this. Done. Yes. And thank you, everybody, for um, coming along and uh, yeah, being here on a, a Friday evening. And I hope it was uh, useful for you all. And congratulations again for uh, winning, uh, winning. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, guys, I will stop the recording now unless anybody's got any last questions. No. I, I get gobsmacked. It's so quiet. I'm used to a lot of abuse and things like that, but it's lovely to see. And, and you know, a massive thank you to Terry and the guys at Data Colour for asking me to get involved as well.